Welcome to Data Skeptic K-Means Clustering, the podcast exploring the problem, the algorithms, enhancements, and use cases for K-Means Clustering. Hello, my name is Gregory Glatzer. I am currently an undergraduate student at the Pennsylvania State University in the College of Information Science and Technology. And what are you studying there? I'm studying applied data science. So the project we're going to talk about obviously includes some data science, but also some, would you call it, life sciences as well? Yeah. And uh, is that part of your career as well, or did you come at this from purely a numeric side of things? From a numeric side of things, I was doing undergraduate research, and the faculty that was leading the research, they had some interest in the domain of uh, wildlife conservation. So that's where I got into this from. Broadly speaking, can you talk a little bit about what opportunities there are, even beyond what you're doing, to overlap between conservation and data science? Yeah, so in conservation, there's what I'm doing, which is looking at the movement of animals and trying to understand that. As you can imagine, there's lots of data there to do data science with, especially movement data. We also look a lot at vegetation and elevation data. And then there's also the aspect of trying to prevent and catch poachers that are trying to poach animals in national parks. So there's a couple studies that have been done with that, doing things like computer vision, where they put drones in the sky and try to catch the poachers at night doing some machine learning with computer vision. Well, these are very virtuous things for sure. I know conservation is very important, but I don't think of it as something that is rich in data where I can, you know, tap into something and apply algorithms. What data sets do you have available? The data sets in this domain is a little touchy because, as you can imagine, with conservation, the nature of it, the animals and the data related to them can be held very closely by the people who have that data. Such with elephants, you know, if you know where the elephants are, that's obviously what we don't want the poachers to know, right? So with data sets... They're often held in universities or by governments that run these national parks. And even more data about poachers and poacher activity, that's also held very carefully. So with that said, with my research, that was the first major hurdle I have to overcome of finding data that I can use to do what I wanted to do. And I ended up finding it. There is a wonderful repository of animal movement data. It's called MoveBank, and on there, lots of different studies. They link to the studies and the data, and you can download tons of public data on animal movement. And what is that? I'm thinking of something like my fitness tracker where I get a GPS path. Do I get basically the equivalent, but for an animal? Yeah, so the way that this data was collected and with lots of other movement studies is they put some kind of tracking collar or a chip maybe on smaller animals and then they ping them at some interval, whether that's every hour or every 10 minutes, whatever they want to do. And like you said, it's just like a giant Fitbit for an elephant. I like to think comically that it's like a big collar around the elephant's neck, but it's probably not that. Yeah, so they're pinging the elephant's location and gathering it that way. And can we skip ahead to some of the goals? What do you want to achieve with this data? So with the study that I did, the overall goal was identifying locations of interest for elephants. So when elephants move, they exhibit what's called shuttling motion, where they travel for long distances and then they stop in an area and then they travel for long distances again and repeat. And By using clustering algorithms on this movement data, our goal is to identify what these locations of interest are, because if we can cluster and differentiate between those long strands of data points versus when they stop, we can identify those locations of interest and then say, okay, is this a village maybe, or is it a body of water, is it shade? And that can give us more insight into why the elephants are moving the way they are and where they're stopping. And then down the road, hopefully we can apply this to movement data from other animals as well. Even before there was such fine-grained tracking data, certainly some biologists or the right academic were doing at least anecdotal studies and had some intuition or rules of thumb about the movement of elephants. What in general was known before you started looking at the data? 
So we knew that the shuttling motion was happening. There had been other studies done that they figured that out. And I'm not an elephant expert. I focus, like I said before, more on the data science side of stuff. But I can imagine park rangers probably had just figured that out beforehand without doing fancy statistics and everything. So the nature of the elephant's movement was known beforehand and things like heat having an influence on the movement of elephants. That was also known beforehand from some past studies, which was definitely a strong starting point for the study we did. One thing my fitness tracker doesn't tell me is the local temperature uh, for wherever I was. How do you get it? Yeah, so the temperature, we did our study using a couple different data sets. And one data set, which was from Kruger National Park, that one, they were collecting temperature with each movement data point they collected. The study they were doing was specifically related to how temperature affected elephant movement. So because of that, the tracker they had on the elephant also had a sensor to pick up heat. So we had that data point, that, you know, column, that feature in the data to use in our model. And then for temperature in other data sets, this was a big problem in our study, that we saw that temperature allowed us to cluster better. It was a good, shall I say, predictor of the clustering movement of elephants. It explained it often. So we wanted to have this temperature data in other data sets But the problem is other data sets, they didn't have a reason to collect temperatures, so they didn't. So we couldn't use that feature. So we needed to kind of generate it or collect it in some other way after the fact. So what we ended up doing is we used a historical weather API called Meteostat. And using that, we were able to approximate the temperature collected on that day by looking at the historical temperature records gathered from weather stations in the area. And then we could, you know, just do like a table drawing on the timestamp and say, this is what we think the temperature was to then do our analysis. So clustering was a technique or a methodology you chose to pick up. There's any number of other algorithms that might have been applied to this data set. Why choose clustering? How could that inform your analysis? So not just clustering, but the specific clustering algorithm we chose helped us perform this analysis on this specific domain. So because elephants aren't just being in one area and then jumping to another area and magically being in another geographic area as another cluster, it's it's not like a classification problem. You know, since elephants are physically moving, they need to move from one cluster to the next. So there's going to be a trail of points to the next cluster. So we ended up using a algorithm that can deal with that kind of movement called dbscan, which has a concept of noise in the data. So by using a specific clustering algorithm, we were able to differentiate between where the elephants are clustering around some feature, whether it's a village or water source, versus when they're moving to the next area that they're going to cluster around. So then the clusters you come up with, they'll be based on the latitude and longitude, and I guess the temperature as well can be a variable. That doesn't include any of those features you'd mentioned. How well do the calculated clusters align with the places that a human observer thinks of as hubs for elephants? Yeah, so that was kind of the final step in our research. You know, you do all this clustering and you're staring at graphs all day long that are just latitude and longitude, not really having an idea of how well these clusters are performing, like that doesn't mean anything. So we then overlay our results onto human settlements and also bodies of water. And we found two things. We found that elephants tend to cluster their movement around rivers and around some campsites. So with the campsites, we found a couple instances where the campsite, according to the National Parks website that the camp was in, so National Parks would set up these areas for tourists to stay overnight when they're in the National Park on safari, right? And they will set up watering holes in the campsites trying to draw animals near them. So we saw that the clusters we calculated ended up being centered around 
campsites, especially ones with watering holes for the elephants to go to. So we took the results of the clustering and overlaid it on top and just browsed through the data. So I'm saying browsing as it was a manual task where we needed to find which clusters associated with some real life thing of interest, like a body of water or a village. But that manual process of finding those real world features to see what that is of interest of, we wanted to automate that too. So I I guess that brings us to talking about the second form of clustering we used in the study. So we first clustered on the movement of the elephant to find those clusters based on their latitude longitude coordinates. But then after that, we wanted to also automate the detection of what villages maybe park rangers would want to focus on to say elephants might be clustering their movement around this village versus another village that they don't care too much about. And we did that with K-means. So with K-means, what we did is we have all these what we called elephant centroids. It's just the centroid of any given cluster that we calculated. And we wanted to see where a bunch of elephant centroids, maybe of different elephants or just a single elephant kind of having these little mini clusters just with this movement. We wanted to see what known campsites, because we know what the campsites are, what known campsites elephants are clustering their movement around a lot versus others. So where K-means comes in here is that we set up the algorithm where we take each location of a known human settlement, one of those campsites, and we set that as the initialization of the centroid in the K-means algorithm, right? So traditionally in K-means, You run the algorithm and then it updates the location of the centroid until you keep on going and then it converges, right? But the way we use k-means was to serve a different purpose. By initializing the centroids as the locations of these campsites, we can then classify all the surrounding elephant centroids to these k-means centroids. And by doing that, we kind of associate a bunch of centroids to each k-mean centroid. And then we can count how many centroids are in the different clusters calculated with k-means. And then we can just rank the different human settlements of how many elephant centroids are associated with that. Today's data lives in the cloud, so your business needs a cloud-native, next-generation solution for intelligent, accessible data analytics. Astrato is a modern BI solution for modern BI teams. Your organization's data already lives in the cloud, which means you can access the single source of truth. Astrato accesses your data where it already lives with a live query approach, so there's no need for data movement, ever. You maintain the agility, speed, and elasticity that modern cloud data warehouses deliver. Astrato's gallery of examples will give you a quick impression of the power Astrato can give your team. The sales workbook example gives me a good indication of the quality of dashboard I can create for my collaborators. And the Tour de France workshop shows off a few other features on competitive cycling data that I could see being really inspiring on implementation for when I have a demanding executive that needs to really slice and dice the data in a lot of custom ways. When I first started exploring Estrato, I connected a Google Sheet of one of my data sets just so I could kick the tires. After that, integrating with Snowflake as a backend was super easy. You'll find that integration to be pretty painless and definitely worth your time checking out if you're a Snowflake user. With Estrato, you can bring complex data to life with no coding skills necessary. To learn more, visit estrato.io slash dataskeptic. Estrato is A-S-T-R-A-T-O. Estrato.io slash dataskeptic. VPLS is a managed service provider and managed security provider with a 20-year history of industry-leading customer service. VPLS's network and security operation centers can be an additional resource for your IT team or function as an outsourced IT department. They offer help desk, managed security, managed backup, and other managed IT services. They handle the IT needs of both large and growing companies and can help your team with IT needs of all sizes. They operate 24-7, 365. Who else does that? Maybe they're a good fit for after-hour support for your team. 
When it comes to things like cloud migration or backup and disaster recovery, you're going to need outside expert help. VPLS is a great fit for companies with existing IT staff and teams, but may have some gaps in their IT framework, which could include cybersecurity, network optimization, and more. They're great for companies without existing IT support who are looking for experts to manage their entire IT infrastructure. And they're great for companies looking for IT expertise for a specific project or issue. Visit vpls.com slash go IT to see all their offers, including a low monthly co-location rate for new customers. That's vpls.com slash go IT. Do you end up then with basically like an affinity between the human settlements or human areas of interest and the particular elephant centroids you're finding? We don't get, should I say, like a distribution of how tightly correlated they are, but we do see how many of the elephant centroids there are near a human settlement. So we can just get a single number saying there's 26 elephant centroids around this settlement, and then the next has 16. And you can pretty much just say, I want, you know, the top 10 settlements based on how many elephant centroids are around that. So we do get an association in that sense. Well, I think there's a lot of virtue in just analysis to better understand these animals and their movements. But what would be really great is if there's some way you can inform the conservationists that would help them do their job cheaper, better, faster, easier, something like that. Is there enough in the data that you can work uh, with people on the ground and help them make their job easier? The one caveat I'd say with this is you need a good amount of data of elephants' movement from the past to understand it. It's it's not really a real-time tool, but we can definitely learn from historic data. So what we can do to help the guys on the ground is they can look at our results and say, yes, what we've been observing from the ground and our own knowledge of the movements of elephants within our park. Yes, these are the villages that we know elephants are displaying interest in. And maybe our algorithm might show one or two other villages that they didn't realize elephants are expressing interest in and they can go there and do a little bit more looking into it on their own and see if our algorithm showed anything. But in terms of any like real-time application or use, the way that this is designed is more of a historical analysis. Well, I think K-means is the poster child for clustering algorithm. And then there are many that are sort of variants of K-means. And then, of course, there's dbscan, which is a relatively different idea altogether. Could you talk a little bit about the decision-making process and using both of these approaches? DB scan, the reason why we chose that is because it has that concept of noise. So if you were to do something like K means, it's going to try to put every single point in your data set into some cluster. But the problem with that, like I was saying before, is that elephants need to move to their next cluster. It's not like each data point is within a vacuum where from one data point to get to the next, you need to move there physically. So as a result of that, there's some points that you need to just classify as noise and say, okay, that's not a point of interest for the elephant. That's just the elephant wandering through the forest or something like that to get to their next destination. So that's the main reason why we chose dbscan over a simpler algorithm like k-means. We also did a little bit of looking into another clustering algorithm called optics. Now, this was kind of an afterthought, to be honest, of considering that second algorithm. But if you don't know, optics is a very close cousin of dbscan with a couple of different parameters in the way that it works. But it would be definitely interesting to look into other clustering algorithms that have a concept of noise that would be appropriate to this domain. Another criticism I'll hear people make of k-means is that it really wants to work on Gaussian blobs of data. If you have sort of like a crescent shape or a half moon, that it's not necessarily ideal, whereas maybe dbscan does well in that scenario. The elephant data, does it have to conform to geography in a way that might be inconvenient for k-means? Yeah, so... The elephants will be moving in 
long, like you were saying, blobs. If they're moving along a river, for example, you know, the river is the shape it is. The elephant doesn't care about the data scientist that's going to be looking at their movement two years down the line. <laughs> um, so the elephant's going to move across these geographic features like rivers, or I know elevation is another big influence on elephants' movement. Elephants don't want to travel uphill if they don't need to. So well, one of the areas we were looking at was near Mount Kilimanjaro. As you can imagine, a big mountain like that, the beginning of that mountain or any mountain range will definitely restrict the elephant's movement to not go in that direction. So because of that, you start to see these weird shapes kind of carved out of the data where there's almost like this invisible force when you plot your data. It's like, why are the points not there? And it's because there's some geographic feature that is pushing the movement of the elephant. And like you were saying, with something like K-means, that causes problems when your data isn't a nice circle. And then what about the human settlement data made it more amenable? Were you trying to apply K-means there? Yeah, so K-means, it's interesting. I almost view our use of k-means not as clustering. Let me explain how I came to to using k-means for that. So what I wanted to do is we had these different human settlements, and my goal was in some unknown way to calculate how many elephant centroids were near these different human settlements. So I needed some way to calculate the distance to these different settlements and then associate each of the different elephant centroids to the settlements. So I take k-means almost as a classification algorithm in that sense, where it calculates the distance from each point to each centroid, right? And then associates them with those different centroids. Um, since we're not updating the location of the centroids, but just running the algorithm for one iteration, what it's doing in that sense is not finding the best centroids, but rather taking a collection of points and saying, you belong to this centroid. Well, I'm wondering if you'll imagine with me that we have at least one listener who's tied into one of these large financial giving organizations aimed at conservation, and they align money to different projects where they can do the most good. Is there an opportunity to do a lot of good with an investment like that? Would it be more equipment, better data? What are your thoughts on it? I think it would be going to supporting the park rangers that are out there. When you look at more on the end of preventing poaching. Some of these national parks are huge. We're talking hundreds of thousands of square kilometers for a park. And these park rangers, there might be 10 or 15 guys out there trying to catch the poachers in the park. And when we're talking about poaching, the poachers put out these traps that are pretty much a giant glorified zip tie that they just lay out in the bush. And the goal is for the elephant to step in it, and then the elephant becomes trapped and the poacher comes along. So these traps are called snares. And the 15 guys that are patrolling this huge area are trying to catch these snares out hidden in bushes and stuff before the endangered animals get caught in them. So if you were to have the ability to contribute financially to this cause, I would figure out how you can donate directly to national parks to maybe incentivize more people to become park rangers or help park rangers invest in technologies, whether that is drones to help catch poachers with the image recognition I talked about in the beginning or some other yet to be discovered technology to help out with that problem. Well, what about your own next steps? Is this part of a larger effort in your ongoing data science journey or just one step along the way? More or less as one step along the way. When I did this research, I ended up presenting at the Tawiri conference, which is the Tanzania Wildlife uh, Research Institute. So they're based right near Mount Kilimanjaro in Arusha, Tanzania. And 
I ended up presenting this paper at the conference. And because of COVID and various travel difficulties, I didn't get to go in person to present, but I presented virtually. And after that, I ended up getting reached out by someone who saw my paper at the conference, who is working with the Tawiri Institute. And now I'm doing more elephant movement research on another study. But overall, in the big picture, this is just a stepping stone in my data science journey. Very cool. Well, a neat project. I'm glad to hear there's still some ongoing effort. Gregory, is there anywhere people can follow you online? For one thing, you can reach out to me and see some of my other work at my portfolio website. You can find at g1776.github.io. And that actually, so besides data science, and something I'm very interested in is full stack web development. So I built that portfolio website by myself from the ground up using React. And I'm definitely a big proponent of building applications that allow people to interact with data science and explore with it in the real world. So that's where my love for full stack development kind of comes together with data science. Well, keep me posted as you've got new releases coming out. Uh, Very interested in that area. Well, Greg, thanks so much for coming on Data Skeptic. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks for listening to the second installment of Data Skeptic K-Means Clustering. Vanessa Bly does guest coordination. Claudia Armbruster is our associate producer. And show notes by David Abembe. And I've been your host, Kyle Pulich.